Welcome to the Bakersfield City Council meeting. This television broadcast is brought to you by the local cable companies, the County of Kern and the City of Bakersfield. You can watch the rebroadcast of this meeting Saturday at 7 p.m., Sunday at 10 a.m., and the following Wednesday at 7 p.m. You can download the agenda for this meeting at www.bakersfieldcity.us. Presiding over this evening's meeting, the Honorable Mayor Karen K. Go. Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the January 23rd, 2019 City Council meeting. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Go. Here. Vice Mayor Parlier. Here. Councilmember Rivera. Councilmember Gonzalez. Here. Councilmember Weir. Councilmember Smith. I am here. Councilmember Freeman. And Councilmember Sullivan. Here. Thank you. Well, welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us. It's always wonderful to see students also out there. And I see we have some renegades. Welcome. And then our Boy Scouts uh, with troop. What's the name of the troop again? The number? 188. Well, welcome here, and then their scout leader is going to be the first to lead a girls' version of the Boy Scouts in our community. So we're looking forward to that. Are there any students from CSUB? Well, welcome to all of you. At this time, we're going to have the privilege of having Pastor Kate Wallace Nunley, who's pastor of Wellspring Free Methodist Church, uh, offer the invocation. And I am so glad that one of your freedoms, Pastor, that you emphasize in the five freedoms, is the freedom of the poor to be treated with dignity and respect by the church and in the world, and that you are attempting to restore the image of God in families, in our community, and in the world. We're honored to have you today. And then right after you pray, we're going to welcome Shereni Donis Horantes, who is a senior at South High. She's going to offer the pledge. This is a superstar. ASB president, 4.2 GPA, two-time Valley champion wrestler. Wow. Uh, Site Council Representative, Math Science Engineering Academy, and plans to attend college in the fall, majoring in math and participating in a collegiate wrestling program. So, Pastor Kate, would you all please stand? Thank you, Mayor Go, Council members, city officials, and all in attendance. It is an honor to be here on behalf of Wellspring Free Methodist Church. Let us pray for the city that we love. Gracious God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. As we come to seek the best for our community, guide our decisions, and multiply our efforts. God, let it be true of us that we sought to bring about what is good, and we helped those most vulnerable members of our community. In the words of your precious St. Francis, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love, where there is injury, pardon, where there is doubt, faith, where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. We give you this time and we ask your blessing on this meeting, this council, and this city, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kate. Salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and you may be seated. Here are a few guidelines to help our meeting run smoothly. We request that you turn off your phones. In keeping with council policy, council members aren't allowed to receive or send electronic communication during the meeting. Please be courteous in the use of cameras and videos. Applause is allowed during the presentations portion of the meeting, but it's not allowed at other times. For safety reasons, signs aren't allowed in the chamber. We thank you so much for your cooperation this night. We look forward to a great meeting. Madam Clerk, first item, please. 
Under presentations, we have a proclamation to Dustin Contreras, Sandy Wu, and Jane Tucker of the Kern Coalition Against Human Trafficking, declaring Human Trafficking Awareness Month in Bakersfield during January 2019. Colleagues, would you agree that human trafficking is an abomination and together we must abolish it? No child, no teen, no woman, no man should be subject to this heinous crime of modern day slavery. And it's my privilege today to have Dustin Contreras, who is one of the co-chairs of the Kern Coalition Against Human Trafficking. Such wonderful efforts they have made together in our community. Unfortunately, we're seeing teens, Young people, Dustin, you're going to talk more about this, but it's not the people that we've traditionally thought as being those who are human trafficked. So it's my honor to, pe to present this proclamation from the Office of the Mayor. Whereas human trafficking has become a modern day version of slavery that exploits victims through coercion, forcing them to perform services for profit, including but not limited to commercial sex acts, various exploitations of labor. And whereas it's estimated that more than 20 million people are victims of this deplorable practice. And the total number of victims in the country is projected to be in the hundreds of thousands. Whereas an estimated one out of seven endangered runaways reported to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children were likely self sex trafficking victims, children that is. Whereas Human Trafficking Month highlights the plight of victims and encourages citizens to be vigilant in reporting instances of human trafficking or suspected trafficking. Now, therefore, I, Karen Go, Mayor of the City of Bakersfield, do hereby proclaim January 2019 as Human Trafficking Awareness Month in our city and call upon all citizens to support obliteration of this dreadful crime in our community and all around the world. It's dated at Bakersfield, California, this day of January 2019. And Dustin, it is my honor to be able to present this to you. Thank you so much for your diligent efforts, for your passion to care for the most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you all. Uh, like the mayor said, uh, we are a coalition, so uh, I. I don't like to take any credit for all this. This has to go to my volunteers and everyone else. So uh, thank you again to the mayor. Thank you to the council for this proclamation. Um, when you think of Kern County and you think of Bakersfield as, as a whole, it's real easy to lose concept of why uh, the focus of human trafficking here in Bakersfield. And it's real simple. If you look at the highways that come through Bakersfield and you look at the interconnection to Las Vegas, which is uh, by far the mecca of human trafficking in the world uh, and how our close proximity is to that. Um, Bakersfield is a hotbed for human trafficking victims that come here from other cities and other states. Um, the current coalition is comprised of at least 50 uh, non-government organizations and government organizations. Um, again, we couldn't do it out with, without the partners and the volunteers uh, that help out to build the survivors of this crime against humanity. Um, I want to say thank you to uh, law, my law enforcement partners, Sheriff Youngblood and uh, Bakersfield Police Chief Lyle Martin, who's been instrumental in, in focusing his detectives, Brian West, namely, and uh, Glenn Fippen, on having a victim-centered approach to how the victims are approached in the investigation, uh, not just arresting someone for prostitution, but looking deeper in that and why they do the things that they do and if they're being forced or coerced to do those things. Um, from the Department of Human Services, which works closely with uh, the Bakersfield Police Department, uh, Dina Murphy and Aaron Gillespie, uh, who have been instrumental in creating a, a unit that specifically investigates underage uh, trafficking victims. Uh, they, they, their investigations are tailored to look into um, how that person got into this trafficking situation. So I want to say thank you to them. Um, to Lewis Gill from the Alliance, who's uh, also been instrumental in, in the work that we do. And Carol Beecroft, uh, who is uh, 
the head of the Women's Center High Desert was basically the sister agency of the Alliance, which handles the east portion of the county. Uh, I don't want to forget my two uh, co-directors, which are uh, uh, Sandy Wu, um, who wish she could be here, but she is actually actively involved in an investigation right now involving human trafficking in our city. Um, and Karen Stone, who is also part of Women's Center High Desert uh, and is one of the co-directors that helps here. My number one volunteer, Ms. Jane Tucker, she's a member of, uh, she's a uh, Bakersfield resident. She helps us out in everything that we do and out of her kindness of heart and her love for uh, the victims of this crime. Um, I always like to talk about how um, if you see something, say something, and that, that is a, a true thing. Um, everyone in this room in their personal and professional lives may come across a trafficking victim and not even know it. Um, I, I ask that you look for those signs, um, try to identify someone, help a victim, rescue them, and empower them to become a survivor, and we'll be there to help with you. Thank you. Uh, to the council, thank you, Mayor, again. And this is one of my favorite times of the year when we get to highlight our four dream builders, which started in 2003. Come on up, team. You're my favorites. The four dream builder uh, team serves to share the value of civic responsibility, and they encourage a lifetime of commitment to civic responsibility. Uh, every year, 32 high school seniors, the very best of the best, uh, separate into groups of eight, and they each get to choose a project. And today, it's my honor to be able to highlight Project Vape. And we'll let them introduce themselves in a minute, but I'd like to issue this proclamation. Whereas vaping is the practice of inhaling and exhaling vapor, which can include nicotine produced by an e-cigarette. And whereas e-cigarettes arrived on the market uh, since its arrival has become a $2.5 billion business in the US. And as of 2014, the e-cigarette industry has spent approximately $125 million a year in advertising. And whereas flavored e-cigarettes are now the most commonly used form of tobacco by middle school and high school students in the United States, with eight out of 10 youth ages 12 to 17 using the flavored cigarettes daily. And whereas the four dream builders and the four project escape the vape, aim to prevent our youth from vaping and bring awareness to our community by providing informative videos on the fallacies of vaping and advertisement, and whereas the four dream builders and Project Escape the Vape also aim to promote a healthy lifestyle free of nicotine in youth across the country. Now, therefore, I, Karen Go, Mayor of the City of Bakersfield, do hereby proclaim the second week in February 2019 as Vaping Awareness Week in our city and encourage all residents to remain firm in condemning vaping among our youth and continue to increase awareness of the dangers of students using e-cigarettes and tobacco. So it's my honor to, be, to present this to our leader of the group, Naomi Grace Jennings from Stockdale High School. Thank you so much. And if you would be so kind to introduce the rest of your fine they team. Choose themselves. Okay, whatever you choose to do, you're okay, the boss. This is by no means am I the leader of the group, but yes, my name is Naomi Jennings and I attend Stockdale High School. My name is Evan Berry and I attend Garces Memorial High School. Sean Crowley and I attend Bakersfield High School. Nate Rhodes and I go to BCHS High School. My name is Amador Gallardo, and I attend East Bakersfield High School. My name is Noemi Martinez, and I go to Miramonte High School. My name is Isela Piña, and I attend South High School. 
My name is Serena Rojas, and I attend Independence High School. Wonderful. Who would like to speak? I think Marigo pretty much covered it for us. Thank you. But once again, I'd just like to say our group kind of collaborated, and we came together at the, at the beginning of this year, and we saw an increase in our peers vaping, even in schools, just kind of outside, kind of just all around us. And we realized that this is definitely a problem. And the tobacco companies, Big Tobacco, advertises as if jewels or these vaping devices are better than smoking, and they really are not. The substances can, that vaping contains are definitely addictive, if not the same kind of addictive purpose as tobacco. So we just saw that as a problem, and we wanted to address it. So we'd like to thank all of you guys for having us here and for this proclamation itself. So thank you. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Public statements. At this time, we'll receive public statements. All statements are given a three-minute time limit, 15 minutes per topic. If you have written comments that are longer than your verbal statement, please give those to the clerk, and she'll give copies to the council. Please avoid any behavior that disrupts the meeting. We're very interested in your issues, but uh, due to the brown... Act, uh, the public notice requirements, the council can't take action when an item isn't on the agenda. The council can, however, refer your matter to committee or request that staff contact you. Madam Clerk, for speaker, please. Mayor Go, we have received five public speaker cards this evening, one regarding a single subject and four regarding the uh, Bakersfield Public Safety and Vital City Services measure, um, and that's five speakers in total. The first speaker this evening is Curtis Bingham. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Yes, said Honorable Mayor and. Uh, Honorable Board, my name is Curtis James Bingham, Senior Street Evangelist for our Lord and Savior, God Almighty, Jesus Christ, who truly is the only begotten Son of our Holy Heavenly Father, God Almighty. i also like to say when you come down to see City Council, another name for you guys would be Blessing. You guys are a strong, strong, beautiful blessing to the city of Bakersfield. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that in the name of the Lord. i also like to say uh, you know, the Lord tells us that this world is going to end because of evil, they're going to refuse to stop doing it. So everything you guys have been doing for law enforcement is highly appreciated and respected. I've been down here enough, and you guys have done quite a bit. And so the Lord would just like to thank you guys. And these three positions we're trying to get full time downtown. I'm um, here to just want to say, anytime you continue to do something to make things in a truthful manner, things work itself out in a better way. You know, and then we also have to, to look at also, I want to thank you guys for letting that penny get on the ballot. It's on the ballot. So now we've got $50 million coming up. And I'm praying and hope we be fair because people come out the woodworks when it comes to money. And this money should really, really take a good look at law enforcement, the fire department, the district attorney. Fill them up first because that's our backbone. That's our strength. Can't no city run if we don't have that in a positive direction. I pray you guys fill them up to the max. Let them get caught up for the things they've been lacking so we can keep on moving in a positive direction. God Almighty has given you guys rest. 
rest means you don't have to worry about them coming in and going on your other funds anymore because God has provided $50 million. Fill them up. Fill them up. The vice unit could use $50 million tonight. It's tough fighting criminals when they have all kind of money. It's like when law enforcement go out, it's like they're up against a billion dollars to them having $10 million. Crime stays and keeps going all over the world because they got money. See? And so we're going to need that. So sometimes they may come in for a large amount to keep their operation going. The Lord has provided this $50 million. Let's make sure we give them some. Let them get out there doing what they're doing because our world is not doing very well. We had an officer Monday just pulling somebody over, doing his job, and he shot him in the face. Got shot in the face. It's getting tough out there. They're not fearing the law anymore. So we got to recognize the Lord say he's over law enforcement. And so let's do everything that we can do to bless them with this $50 million. Because people are going to be asking for this money. And one of the things, to honor integrity that you guys have, each one of you guys can handle that $50 million yourself. I know we got nine people coming in overseers, but you guys could do it yourself because you wouldn't be sitting there if you couldn't. But some things have to be done. But I just wanted to honor you that with the integrity that you guys have. And uh, just let's do, do a blessing when law enforcement come in. Let's put them on top because if, if they go to work happy, you're going to have some great workers. The fire department and the and um, uh, Vegas Police Department, they the same. They got to cover every house, every building, every park. They got to cover it all. They got to be there for us. Look how good we're doing with the freeway and all the new business and everything. You guys are doing outstanding. And you, we have a powerful board. You know, like we say, we're a superpower. Thank you, you guys Mr. are a superpower, too. So thank you, okay? And thank pray God much. bless everybody. Thank you, Mr. Bingham. Next speaker, please. Mayor Go. I have received a request to defer the comments uh, regarding the Bakersfield Public Safety and, and Vital uh, Services Measure Citizens Oversight Committee uh, for the comments to be heard when that item comes up on the agenda. City Manager, any comments on that? Uh, based on a conversation I had with one of them this afternoon, I think they want to hear the staff presentation perhaps before they comment. Is that correct? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So how many does that involve? Uh, is that the rest of them? We have, yeah, four speakers regarding that item. Sure, we can do that. Is there anyone else, Madam Clerk? We have no other speakers, Mayor. Thank you. Next item, please. Under workshops, item A, Bakersfield Public Safety and Vital Services Measure Citizens Oversight Committee Appointment Voting Method. Mr. Tandy. Honorable Mayor and members of council, uh, council member of Vera, who I think may have a, a conflict with LAFCO, he has double bookings on certain uh, Wednesday evenings, <clears throat> asked that this item appear on the agenda so that clarification could be given by the council on the mechanism or the methodology that would be used at your next regular meeting uh, to select the oversight committee members. Uh, staff has identified, <coughs> excuse me, two mechanisms, and uh, the city attorney may wish to comment after I'm done. Uh, first of all, I apologize, but on Friday, um, we sent out the administrative report. It identified an out-of-date resolution uh, calling uh, for how to identify or how to, how to process the, uh, uh, the appointment list. So we realized that today or yesterday and we sent out a corrected version. So we're dealing with council resolution 11306 <clears throat> and the mechanism it calls for <coughs> is to give the council members a written ballot with all of the names of the applicants on it. Uh, by the way, as of today we had 28 and we're predicting that that may double. Uh, the nominee receiving the most votes, regardless of how many council members are actually present or actually vote, shall be appointed to fill the vacancy. Uh, that could be three votes or two, uh, given a large field of candidates. Uh, if there's a tie for the most votes uh, cast, the mayor breaks the tie. A uh, second option was from Robert's Rules, just open nominations, kind of the historic mechanism of doing this. Uh, council members could uh, get the recognition from the mayor and nominate one candidate or could nominate 
a slate of candidates provided by the uh, community organizations who are participating or other mechanisms. And under this, uh, it would go until uh, all nine uh, members were appointed. Uh, Council Member Smith uh, also contacted me and has a proposed uh, concept uh, to use, uh, so that you'll have a third option if I could defer to him. Yeah, it's a little bit complicated, but <coughs> I, we, we'd have the list of all the names and the first ballot. Uh, each council member would vote for nine, and all appointments receiving over four votes uh, would be deemed appointed unless more than nine received four plus votes. In that case, we would again vote with only the names of the four plus votes. So if we had 15 that had four plus, then we'd vote on those 15 out of the 30, 40, whatever we get. And then round two, then we'd come back with round two and we'd delete the names of the four plus votes and the zero vote getters. And each council member would then vote on the number of the remaining positions. If we had five left, then each council member would vote five. And all appointments receiving over four votes would be deemed appointed unless more than the remaining positions received four plus votes. In that case, we vote again and only the names of the four plus votes. So we would keep going that way until we had the nine votes uh, was my idea. Thank you. Daff recommends you hear the public speakers and then uh, enjoy the uh, ability to make a decision. I would just like to add, Mayor, if you don't mind, that um, city manager is correct that the resolution that the council currently has is 113-06. Uh, that is the resolution that was attached to your blue memo tonight, not the admin report. Um, and for some of us that were here, I believe uh, the city manager and I believe council member Sullivan at the time, uh, you may recall that this resolution was enacted back in 2006 and it says exactly in the resolution, the reason why we repealed the old one is because the old one was very cumbersome and it was difficult to apply when there was more than two nominees for a particular vacancy. In fact, I, can, um, I vaguely recall being here one night and it was very difficult for the council uh, to acquire four votes for one particular candidate and the ballots went on and on and on. So that's just something that I think you may want to think about when, um, when you're here tonight discussing how you want to elect that oversight committee. Thank you. Thank you, Madam City Attorney. We do not have the blue memos. Does anybody have the blue memo? I did not get Staff. one. I think it's critical that you have the blue memo and the appropriate resolution in order to um, have a clear understanding of the simplicity of your current policy. None of us have it. So we'll. Oh, okay. All right, very good. Thank you. Madam City Attorney, is it necessary that there be a majority vote? Uh, Mayor, that's a, good, that's a very good question because under the current resolution, uh, the, the current resolution simply says that you, you, would, you would ratify basically the nomination of that individual that has the most votes, not the majority vote. Um, however, I need to point out that the resolution that the council adopted at the last city council meeting, which was uh, presented to the council, again, by the city manager's office, it had some very general, general overviews of the citizens' advisory committee, and that indicated in the admin report, as well as the resolution, that the committee members would be selected by a majority vote of the council. So in the event that committee members are not selected by a majority vote, um, we would need to amend that resolution, which of course is very easy. And, and that's not to say that committee members won't be elected by a, by a majority. It's very possible that all nine could be elected by a majority of you. Just, just keep that in mind. Council Member Parlier would like to speak and then we'll have our public speakers. Well, I would just kind of reiter reiterate what you're saying, Jenny, regarding uh, what we adopted last time so we can just come back again and change that because it appears it was an oversight and we just come in line with the 
the council policy, correct? Uh, Vice Mayor, yes, if that's what the council decides to do tonight, correct. Thanks. Thank you. Madam City Clerk, the first speaker, please. Marilyn Droppers. Welcome. Thank you. Mayor Go, council members, my name is Marilyn Droppers. I'm the co-founder of Community Trust. That's trust with two T's at the end and stands for Together, Rebuilding Unity, Seeking Trust and Transparency. We're a local group founded two years ago to build trust and transparency with local law enforcement. Our group of concerned citizens strives to open and sustain communication with law enforcement. We believe we've fostered a dialogue that is beneficial to our community. Please speak, yeah, the, speak mic. In the mic, please. Is this better? better. Sorry. Do you want to just start b back up a couple sentences? Okay. Um, I'm the co-founder of a group called Community Trust. There's two T's at the end of trust, and that stands for together, Rebuilding Unity, Seeking Trust and Transparency. We're a local group founded two years ago to build trust and transparency with local law enforcement. Our group of concerned citizens strives to open and sustain communication with law enforcement. We believe we've fostered a dialogue that is beneficial to our community. We want to make you aware of our existence and our great interest in how the city uses Measure N funds for public safety. We're concerned about the tensions between law enforcement and citizens and believe there is a need for greater transparency on the part of law enforcement. We use the civic process and dialogue to foster trust. Our monthly meetings are open to the public and attended by members of the community as well as officers from both the Bakersfield Police Department and Kern County Sheriff's Office. Community Trust advocates for the Task Force for 21st Century Policing. We educate the community on local law enforcement issues and participate in training provided by both the BPD and the Sheriff's Office. To that end, we have attend, uh, attended trainings put on by both the BPD and the Sheriff's Office, and several members have completed an 11-week course on in the Community Academy from the Sheriff's Office. We participate in Bakersfield Police Department's Safe Streets Partnership and gang call-ins. We are currently working on a program to foster dialogue between BPD and citizens in the highest crime area of our city, known as the Two Square Miles. This is of special concern because frequently residents do not trust the police enough to report a crime or cooperate in investigations. I have more detailed information on our activities and contact information for anyone who may be interested, and you may also see more information at our Facebook page. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Next public speaker, please. Kaylin Peterson. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the Council. My name is Kaylin Peterson, and I represent the Greater Bakersfield Chamber of Commerce. We appreciate the opportunity to comment on this matter tonight and appreciate the thought that both members of the Council and staff have put into the selection process for this important committee. After reviewing the staff report and consulting with the City Manager's Office, we concur in a broad sense that the normal selection process for city boards and commissions would be cumbersome and not appropriate with this large of an applicant pool. We are open to alternative selection processes with one large caveat, that the final process will follow the wording and the resolutions placing Measure N on the ballot and creating the oversight committee that prioritize applicants who are recommended or nominated by the five business organizations identified. Our organizations represent a large number of businesses and their employees, and literally thousands of city residents can claim membership in one or more of our organizations. Once the application window closes, the Chamber, the Association of Realtors, and the Kern Taxpayers Association 
plan to provide you with the list of our recommended applicants or nominees. This will be a subset of the total applicant pool. Thank you again, and please let our organizations know if you have any further questions or concerns. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Next public speaker, please. Michael Turnipseed. I'm Welcome. Michael Turnipseed. I represent the Kern County Taxpayers Association. I just want to remember, remind the council that back in June, we were putting all our support together. The city made some very strong commitments to the business groups. And we just want to make sure that these commitments are honored because we went out there and we uh, worked hard to get this passed. So I just want to remind you of that, please. Thank you, Mr. Turnipseed. Next speaker, please. Terry Maxwell. Good evening. My name is Terry Maxwell. Um, I would have been here on time, except for I live right off of 24th Street. And of course, you can't make a left-hand turn on 24th Street at this time of the day. You have to go down to S Street, but that's only one lane, so you couldn't go that way. I had to go down to 8th Street, and 8th Street, of course, all the lights are not coordinated. So it took me a while to get here, like over 10 minutes. Um, oversight Committee. Um, I'm not sure why we needed an oversight committee. I, I kind of thought that's what the city council was for. Um, but I suggest that if you are going to have this oversight committee, that that, that committee have 100% control over the money. That this is in there, that they, they, they hold the tight purse strings on that money. That the staff has to then put together how they want to spend that money and go in front of that committee and explain to them how they're going to use it so a lot of questions can be asked. Uh, if it's going to be the other way around where the staff just comes and says this is what we're spending the money on, uh, then we really don't need the oversight committee because that would just be one more layer of, of city council people that they're going to get through. So I would highly suggest they control 100% of the money and that the staff has to go to them in order to get an approval before they can start spending the money. Um, When this, when this uh, campaign started, you got the endorsement from several groups, Kern Tax, uh, Board of Realtors, and uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce. And it was then kind of laid out that there were going to be people from those organizations on this committee. I felt that was fair, very unfair. It's supposed to be a community group that's overseeing. So then I know that that was taken back, that they said, oh, no, no, that's not what we're going to do. Uh, that anybody in the community could go ahead and be on this committee. And now when I look at the literature, when I look at the way that this is put together, now you've put emphasis on these, these groups again. You know, that's, that's pretty dishonest. To go through a campaign and tell people, oh no, that's not the way it's going to be. Everybody can uh, apply for this. We're not going to make any special considerations for people who are members of these organizations. And here you turn around in, in the last meeting when it was presented, and I have gotten a copy of the application. The application states if you are a member of one of these committees, that you, one of these organizations, you are going to get special consideration. I think that's wrong. I think that, that sends a really, really bad bad message to everybody here uh, that you said one thing and now you're doing another. So I would highly recommend that you go back and, and, and change that. That should not have been part of the application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maxwell. Madam Clerk, is there one more speaker? We have one more speaker, Mayor. Uh, Chad Garcia. So I want to Welcome. apologize. I didn't know I was supposed to sign in. I've, That's okay. I, First time, we all make time. mistakes. Not a problem. Spoken down the street a few times, but not here. Um, thank you for what you do for serving our community. Stockdale High School graduate myself. I think that young lady left. Uh, joined the Army in 2001. Served until 2014 when I was medically retired for combat injuries uh, sustained in Afghanistan. When I got my retirement orders, I was in 
Alaska, and I had to make a decision. Do I stay there or move back home to Bakersfield? Well, that key word's home. This is my home. This is where I grew up. This is where I went to school. This is where my friends are. I love this city, and I would very much like to be a part of this committee. Uh, I have 200... I led 200 combat missions in Afghanistan where my fire team alone was in charge of $300,000 worth of equipment and gear. I understand that the revenue brought in by this is a lot more than $300,000, but that was on a daily basis every time we walked outside that wire. I don't have a huge business experience behind me, but I have leadership, uh, very capable leadership, and I hold people accountable, and I'm very outspoken. Why? Because I love my community. I raise my children here like everybody else behind me, and I want to I die here. This is where I want to spend the rest of my life. I love Bakersfield, and so I would be honored to be on this committee and continue serving my community like I did for 13 years. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Oh, no, we're, uh, I see where we are. So, uh, colleagues, Mr. Gonzalez, council member. Thank you, Mayor. I want to thank all the speakers for speaking uh, this evening. Uh, clearly, uh, I think all of us on the council want to find a process that's fair and transparent for all the applicants. And uh, I guess it's good news that we have a large applicant pool because it suggests that there are many people who are interested in what we do with uh, not only with Measure N dollars, but the future of our city. I have a question regarding Resolution 11306. So uh, for the benefit of the public, I'll read um, the points that relate to the process. Um, at a regular city council meeting, the city clerk will distribute written ballots containing the name of all nominees for the vacancy in question. The city council members will mark their ballot, voting for one nominee only, indicate their ward number, and return the ballot to the city clerk. The nominee receiving the most votes cast, regardless of how many council members are actually present or actually vote, shall be appointed to fill the vacancy. If there is a tie for the most votes cast, the mayor shall break the tie by casting a vote for one of the tied nominees. If there are two or more vacancies to be filled, the city clerk shall, after the first vacancy has been filled, follow steps three through six, those items I just read, uh, with the winning nominees' names obliterated from each subsequent ballot. When all the voting has been completed, the ballots shall be available for review. My question is, if a candidate receives, if three candidates receive two votes each, that will then cause a tie. Does then the mayor choose between those three candidates? And subsequent to that, if seven candidates receive one vote, does that then, do those seven candidates then go to the mayor for a, a tiebreaker? Mayor, Council Member Gonzalez, hypothetically speaking, yes. Okay. If that is the case, um, I, I see uh, where Council Member Smith is headed in his proposal uh, in order to ensure that more uh, council members have a, a say in those nominees who are selected. Um, uh, and so I would, I would support his recommendation. Council Member Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I would just reinforce that the way this reads, if we have 50 applicants and each council member gets one vote, it's very likely that we will all vote for separate people, and it would be seven votes for one each, and the mayor would decide. And we would continue to go down that path with the mayor deciding most of the elections, the way I see it. So it makes more sense to me that the council members are in control and four votes from, each, from council members elects an appointee. I did want to say that I had already, I had made a note and I did not read it that, that when the applicants appear on the ballot, 
with the chamber recommendation, the chamber, the board, and the current taxpayers, that recommendation would show on the ballot. And that way the council members, if they so felt, could reinforce, and I agree with what they stated, that uh, they were much help in getting it and their support was important and that they are also vetting those applicants and, and so to note those would make sense. So I'm still in favor of what I presented. Thank you. Do you have any clarification on <clears throat> what was just said? Uh, Mayor, no, it's at the end of the day, it's, it's council's prerogative. I uh, personally, I'm not clear as to the method that uh, council member Smith has laid out. So I hope the rest of the council is. I would note that another way to kind of put a hybrid together is that if someone wanted to vote a slate, uh, you could very easily vote a slate um, of three or four, uh, see if that passed, and then abide by your current policy and obliterate the names of the slate, assuming that the slate received a majority vote. Uh, that would be another way of doing it. So, uh, but again, it's, it's council, council prerogative. Thank you. Councilmember Rivera, would you like? Yeah, thank your you. Your name was here a minute ago. Um, sorry, guys, I don't know how to use this thing. I, and I was at LAFCO, I swear I wasn't just hanging around uh, being late. So I kind of got the tail end of, I, I heard what she explained, Councilmember Smith, but I'm not sure I understood it. Um, and, I, and I apologize for bringing this item up at the last meeting because it sounds like it ended up being a whole lot more complicated than um, I thought it would be, but I think that's why I asked. So I, 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 uh, I get the, the comment about noting, um, noting where applicants have come from. I, I mean, I, I want to say it now, and I, I, don't, I don't know that I've spoken with any of the organizations specifically listed in the resolution, but I'm, I'm not in favor of taking nine candidates from each of those organizations and having a slate um, and then approving that and moving on. I, I don't know that that speaks to a citizen committee. So I, I get the idea that, that they should be noted and highlighted where they're coming from because we agree to give a preference there, but I don't know that I understood how, how the tiering worked, if you could explain it to me I'd, again. I'd love to try again. I, I did send an email and I thought staff would present it to you, but I'm going to have to read it a few times probably. <laughs> so each council member votes for nine appointments on the first ballot. So we each get nine votes and when the names are listed, their affiliation or endorsement by the organizations listed so we know whether or not we want to vote for those. All appointments receiving over four votes shall be deemed appointed unless more than nine receive four plus votes. So if we get 15 that have four plus votes, then we re-vote on those 15. If we only get seven that had four plus, then we adopt those seven. We throw out the ones that didn't get any votes, and we throw out the seven, and then we vote again on the remaining 20 or whatever's left. Is, is there a reason, and just to make sure I didn't miss something, Councilmember Gonzalez mentioned a scenario of 222. Are we going to be missing someone on February 6th? I just want to make sure that we're okay. Because, okay, got it. Got it, okay. Vice Mayor, I think uh, we'd like to speak. We're having a little technology issue, but we'll be fine. I, I was I was just wanting my chance to explain, and, and I was given it. Thank you. Could I ask for a point of clarification? Um, three of the community organizations, I believe, are here tonight. Letters went out to eight. Do you want staff to notify all of them of this procedure so that they will all be equally aware of the fact that the, their endorsements would be noted on the ballot? Absolutely. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Jenny, quick question. If it's deadlocked and we can't get over four votes, how do we break that? Well, should that situation arise, uh, my recommendation at that point would be that the mayor breaks a tie. Okay. So whether you can't get over the four or it's 2-2-1, the mayor's breaking the tie. 
I really don't care necessarily what process we use. I just don't want it shackled in some sort of, you know, dead heat, uh, regardless if it's a one-to-one -one or a four and we can't get over the hump. We just have to have some sort of a, a tiebreaker. Otherwise, we go back to the historic reasons why this policy came to light in the first place is because they went round and round because they couldn't be, get beyond four votes. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Smith. I would make a motion to adopt the method that I presented. Can I get a quick caveat? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Councilmember Weir's name didn't show up, but uh, you wanted to speak, so I'm going to go ahead and. So we've sent notifications out to eight groups and asking them for or informing them of the process and Ca letting and asking them to respond. Uh, Council Member Weir, um, that was yes, the answer is yes. And uh, that was all structured into the uh, information that was contained uh, surrounding the ballot issue that uh, there would be outreach to uh, the organizations that supported the measure when the oversight committee was was approved. Okay, and you're not and bound by it. You're you're uh, okay. you're only bound by your conscience. And uh, but yes, uh, it was structured into the support documents for the ballot measure. Okay, and so now we've taken it a step further. And we're actually going to list their name and their organization on the ballot. So we would be preferential. No, I can't say that. We give preference to those people. And so if there's more than nine of those, why would anybody else apply? Councilman, we're, uh, again, your free agents as a council, and you're not bound to appointing, there aren't nine of them, uh, but you're not bound to appointing all eight. Uh, some <clears throat> probably will not even uh, nominate or put forward candidates. Uh, if I could give a little history, um, Measure N was divisive, uh, as I think you're aware. And the internal composition of some of the community organizations was divided. Uh, and I believe it's correct to say, and, and I'm certainly inviting some of the members of the audience to correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that uh, some of their membership said, yes, we'll support this item, but only if those people are carefully watched by our membership. Um, and so they conditioned their support on that understanding. Uh, and we uh, agreed to it in the documents and wrote it into the ballot. But we're taking it a step further now, and we're putting it on our ballot to elect. So we're not electing based on qualifications of what our assessment of qualifications are now. At this point, we're, we're going to be nominating based on what organization they belong to. Council Member Weir, that's council discretion. I believe it's a part of Council Member Smith's motion. <coughs> if the other alternate, I suppose, is is to have the letters of endorsement sitting next to you on your desk if you wish to refer to them or not. But uh, that's, be, that's a council decision. Okay. Well, I am not of the opinion that that should be there. If we're going to vote for them, we should vote on the qualifications and that person's reputation within the community. And if we want to look at uh, what group they belong to, I'm sure that we will get emails uh, of the slates that various organizations are recommending. So if that is going to be in the ballot, then I'm not going to support this. Councilmember Smith, uh, I'm not sure whether this is a leftover. I think you've already spoken. Uh, Vice Mayor, please. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to have a caveat to your motion, Bob, that if there is a tie that, uh, and it may be at some point down the ballots as they go, that we have a mechanism to break that tie and uh, like to add that the, the mayor could be able to do that. 
Yes, just a clarification that that, that tie would be only f in my mind for the last, the number ninth person because if if earlier on you have two people getting four, then they are seven and eight appointees. Well, I, I guess my point is if there's a a deadlock and we can't get around it for some reason, that absolutely we have, that we have that ability. Yes. Um, also, I want to make a quick clarification. I mean, this committee is extremely important to the city of Bakersfield, and we want, obviously, the best applicants on it. But it is a committee, uh, and if I get some clarification, maybe from the city attorney, just to use a, an analogy, uh, let's say, like the Planning Commission. Uh, you review stuff that comes to the city of Bakersfield, and those recommendations are made to the council but nothing within the charter or anything else that I'm aware of negates the authority of the council. Is that true? Mayor, Vice Mayor, if I understand your question correctly, uh, the, maybe I could state it another way. The Oversight Committee is advisory in nature, period. Uh, it is ultimately up to the council to allocate the monies received on Measure N. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rivera. Thank you, Mayor. Um, again, I apologize, but I must have missed this component. Could you tell me what the eight organizations are? I may need help from Mr. Hewitt, the, uh, the Greater Bakersfield Chamber of Commerce, the uh, Bakersfield Association of Realtors, uh, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the Kern County Taxpayers Association, uh, Downtown Business Association, um, oh, speak. The remaining uh, organization would be the Home Builders Association. Oh, and then uh, the last one was... Uh, north of the River Chamber? N nor north of the River Chamber and also uh, uh, Current Citizens for Sustainable Government. <coughs> okay, so then could I ask a clarifying question of Councilmember Smith? Uh, do we plan to note those eight organizations or simply the organizations we outlined in the resolution? My idea was to whoever they come from, whoever's endorsing them would also be on the ballot. You know, their name and then endorsed by the Chamber of the Realtors, the current taxpayers, somebody else's name endorsed by North of the River, et cetera. So, okay, so you know, as I, as I think, yeah. Uh, Okay, then I think as I think through it more, I'm, I'm less and less comfortable with that as well. I mean, I, I want to hear from, I want to know uh, who you folks are recommending, um, but it, it, seems, it seems a little inappropriate now to, I mean, it seems a little inappropriate to put that on an official city ballot um, when I've never seen that before on any other ballot. Uh, I see names, and then we have a big binder full of applications we review um, based on that information. I, and I've, it's not as if we haven't gotten emails and letters from other folks then uh, up until this point um, with recommendations and interests. So I, I don't, I, I'd actually prefer that not be on the actual ballot, though I, I would like, you know, I'd like to ensure that I, I know who's being recommended from the organizations we uh, we made the commitment to not I don't I don't I don't ever remember having a larger conversation about more organizations but um, for the three I was aware of um, I would like to know from them uh, who they're recommending yeah I, I don't have a problem with that I'm sure like you say we're gonna get emails we're gonna get letters we'll know who's endorsing who it just would simplify it but <laughs> I'm fine with that Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to ask uh, Vice Mayor Parlier uh, a question regarding his um, amendment regarding the tie breakers. So if, if we have uh, a scenario where, as we get further down the balloting process, where uh, candidates have received votes, um, let's, say, let's say three and three, um, it, the, that would then go to the mayor, or only if candidates receive four votes each? Well, 
I don't want to see us get in a position where we're vapor locked up here on on some candidates. I think you know initially as we go through it'll probably be fairly streamlined, but as we get to some point that could happen. And I just want to make sure that there's a mechanism in place that we don't again vapor lock and not have a way to pivot away from or around that. Okay. I, I would just want to support a motion that ensures that the tie would only be broken by the mayor if it's a 4-4 tie. So if there are more than, we will have more than one vote if there's more than one seat available at that time. Okay. I'm going to reserve my comments until uh, maybe some other council members have some opinions on okay. this, and then I'll follow up. Senator, anybody else who would like to speak? I'm not seeing any. Councilmember Sullivan, so press the request to speak. May I also be recognized? Uh, I'm sorry, we're finished with public comments. You, you asked others point. to come up and make comments. You, you opened it up to them, so I think it would be appropriate to open it up to everyone, and I'd like to make a comment after okay. yeah. Councilmember Sullivan. They, they had comment cards, and we had those for this item at that point. When, Councilmember when Sullivan, please. <coughs> okay. Um, now, the applicants that will be considered, are we saying that they, that they would be on, on one of the options, would they be required to come through one of the groups that were, that were named, or they would not? Okay, that's good, because the young man that spoke, for instance, that introduced himself, um, Mr. Garcia, so it would be open to the um, open to the community, but then also mm -hmm. different ones can be brought forward and presented by one of the one of the groups. Is that what we're saying? I think where we're at is that yes, the whole community can apply, mm -hmm. and we will mm -hmm. get endorsements from various community groups and we can or cannot take that into account. I see. Okay, now is that, is that, is that your, your, um, your idea, right? That goes along with, with your Yes, and, it, and it, I think satisfies All of Councilman Rivera's and Councilman Weir's I see. conflict. Okay, great, thank you. If, uh, I apologize, but a good point of clarification. So your motion has been amended, and the names of the endorsing agencies will not appear on the ballot. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Andre, since there is no other comments, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. So just for clarity, then, the deadlock and tie vote to the mayor is only when there's 4-4 four, four vote. That is correct. correct. And so... If there's a 3-3 three, three vote, what are you going to do? Vote again. Okay. Is there anybody else? I don't see any others in the queue. You have a motion. Please cast your votes. Uh, Madam City Attorney, just real quick. Is there a clarification that needs to take place? or No. no. Okay, thanks. If you need assistance with voting, Mr. Kennedy's here. Motion is approved with Councilmember Freeman absent. Thank you. Next item, please. Under appointments, we have an appointment of one regular committee member to Ward 7 and two alternate committee members, Wards 1 and 3, to the Keep Bakersfield Beautiful Committee due to the expiration of terms of members. Thank you. These uh, appointments are by Ward, so no ballots are necessary. I'm going to call on Council Member Rivera and then Weir for the Wards 1 and 3 nominations of the alternate committee members and then the Vice Mayor for Ward 7. Uh, Council Member you, Rivera. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to nominate Anna Smith as my alternate uh, representing uh, Southeast Bakersfield on the Keep Bakersfield Beautiful Committee. Thank you. Council Member Weir. Uh, 
I am recommending Jennifer Pitcher for my alternate. Thank you. Thank you. And Vice Mayor? I nominate Paul Yanez, and I move all nominees. You have a motion. Please cast your votes. Motion is approved with Councilmember Freeman absent. Thank you. Are uh, any of the people who were chosen present? Well, congratulations and thank you very much for your service. We appreciate uh, all your service, uh, Ms. Smith, Pitcher, and Mr. Yanez. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Consent calendar items 8A through 8L for approval. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Does any council member wish to recuse themselves from any items? Does any council member wish to remove a consent calendar item for separate consideration? If there are no other items that need to be pulled for separate consideration, I make a, a motion to approve consent calendar items AA through, correction, 8A through 8L with the exception of the items since there's no items pulled, uh, with the changes noted by the city clerk. Motion? You have a motion. Please cast your votes. Motion is approved. Thank you. Next item, please. Consent calendar public hearings, item 9A through 9E for approval. Thank you. It's now time for the consent calendar hearings. The purpose of this section is to vote on all the items listed under the consent calendar hearings in one motion without further comment. If anyone would like to speak on any of the hearing items listed, the item must be removed from this portion of the agenda. If an item is removed, it will be placed at the end of the regular public hearings portion of the meeting. At this time, I'll open consent calendar public hearing items 9A through 9E. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to request that a hearing item be removed from the consent calendar? If, please, if so, uh, please come forward. This isn't the time to take testimony, testimony only to remove the matter. Does any council member wish to remove an item? Seeing none, at this time, consent calendar public hearings items 9A through 9E are now closed. Vice Mayor? Make a motion that we move items 9A through 9E. You have a motion. Please cast your votes. Motion is approved. Thank you. Next item, please. Under reports, we have homelessness update. Thank you, Mr. Tandy. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and City Council. Uh, Uh, three meetings ago, uh, Mayor Go made the motion, which is up on the board, uh, and I am happy to talk about everything you referred to, except I am unable to talk about ending homelessness, uh, the old expression that that is beyond my job description or my, my uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Tandy, uh, ending homelessness by the federal definition is uh, that it's brief, rare, and non-recurring. That's what, as a, an entire community, we are working towards. I certainly don't expect one agency to be able to do that, but thank you very much. Thank you. I'm happy to talk about the things we do uh, because the city of Bakersfield is really quite active and engaged and has contributed a great deal. And somehow, I don't know why I'm having trouble with this. Uh, maybe. Here we go. Uh, 
And it is, so it is good uh, because we don't really receive full recognition to go over the things we actually do. Annually, uh, we get ESG grants for emergency shelter uh, from the federal government. We pass it on to local agencies, the approximate amount of $270,000. We also uh, allocate periodically community development block grant funds. Uh, this year, uh, we have $71,000, which was uh, done in order to support homelessness outreach services. Uh, and uh, we also partially fund the three downtown officers, which uh, spend a great deal of their time working on homelessness issues uh, at a cost of about $300,000 a year. The uh, home monies, which are for housing, in various years go towards projects which are for the homeless. And one of the proposals uh, that I'll be making a little bit later in the evening is uh, being cognizant of the priority of that need and attempting to dedicate more money annually to the housing which impacts the homeless on the street as opposed to the typical projects. Uh, and there is a never-ending cycle involving about six city departments of doing cleanups of home, homeless campsites uh, and outreach and involvement of uh, service providers uh, to the persons uh, that we're cleaning up after as a part of that process. Uh, more recently, uh, HEAP funding came from the state and uh, we, on your agenda earlier, uh, dedicated uh, a little over a million dollars to the mission of Kern County for an expansion of 40 beds at their facility. Uh, also, uh, a little earlier on your agenda, you approved the last item on this chart, which is a $200,000 grant to the Bakersfield Homeless Shelter. Uh, we have made a, a commitment and are negotiating the contract now uh, to use prior year's uh, block grant funding of 1.2 million in conjunction with the Bakersfield Homeless Shelter to do 40 new beds for females at their facility. Uh, and uh, this is the one that people seem to keep forgetting about. We were really rather innovators in this area of hiring the homeless uh, at four of our work sites. Uh, and the uh, total amount dedicated to that is up to $1.7 million. I believe something over 400 people have been able to go into traditional housing as a result of the work skills and income levels that uh, were developed as a result of the city's sponsorship of that program. The police department has an entire unit uh, that's dedicated primarily to homeless related issues, not 100%, but in a very large part of their measures or services to them, coordination with sponsoring agencies that, that may be able to assist them. Uh, and response to the calls that are created as a result. Uh, we, uh, I, I'm not going to go over all of these, uh, education uh, and coordination of the police department with the uh, outreach uh, entities and the social service agencies providing direct services. We do coordinate and cooperate with them in an effort to get the the best possible response to issues um, beyond just traditional law enforcement. What can we do uh, more or better? Uh, much of the problem is created by state government uh, in releasing prisoners, in having parole policies that result in people getting off at our Amtrak station, uh, in having decriminalized or reducing the criminal penalties uh, for a number of criminal offenses, uh, downgrading them from felonies to misdemeanors uh, with no uh, imprisonment consequence. So certainly continuing to lobby federal and state governments uh, and parties who either have more monetary capability to assist this problem or who could alter regulations so that the problem did not continue to be exacerbated. I know that the mayor is, I guess they just renamed themselves. Now instead of the big 11, it's the big city uh, conference of mayors uh, are continuing to be engaged. Uh, they helped get the HEAP funding that I talked about earlier. And the governor's proposed budget contains another round of HEAP funding. 
Uh, anything else that can be done with state uh, legislature or federal in the funding area, those efforts to lobby should continue. Uh, I encourage staff this year to participate in the annual pointed time count uh, by giving compensatory time off for people who are willing to serve. And uh, I think we're going to get a number of people to assist in that. That has monetary uh, consequences in that the state allocations are based partially in the findings uh, of how many are homeless in accordance with that count. Um, increased support of the Kern County Homeless Collaborative beyond historic levels and uh, developing and funding new affordable housing specifically for homeless. The public services and public safety and vital services measure potential areas of contribution. Uh, and I point out that uh, there were 40 public presentations made with regard to this. We got feedback from a great many people as a result of that participation. And every day in my office, I get love notes from all of you indicating that there is a homeless issue disturbing some of your constituents. The uh, complaints fall to the city in two primary areas, litter, debris, shopping carts, and related damage to property throughout the community and damage and discomfort to business operations, enjoyment of residential property and public properties created by the encampments, loitering and occupancy of all types of property. Uh, whether the uh, perception is real or imagined, uh, some of the homeless tend to frighten citizens and make them nervous. And uh, uh, these are the two greatest areas of impact to the city. Now the overall homeless services include mental issues, alcohol, chemical dependency issues, medical issues. Um, the city has really no expertise uh, in any of those areas, no staff with skills in any of those areas. But the two things we're really good at uh, are building affordable housing and uh, dispatching crews for tasks in the field. Anything we do from this point forward, I'm only presenting you broad-based possibilities for areas of investment. But anything we do moving forward will take place after discussion with the homeless service providers, after feedback, after uh, field tours of uh, best practices models that occur. I believe Mr. Gill is in Texas now looking at some shelters and some facilities to try to glean information on costs and best practices. So this is just an introduction and the actual development of the details would follow those additional uh, communications. Uh, so item one here is, uh, goes by several names, temporary displacement bridge or triage housing. As you are all aware, um, the river um, encampments um, have unsanitary conditions and uh, the debris and litter grows and grows. We're essentially forced to go clean it up periodically just in the interest of public health. Uh, and what, what that causes is disbursement of those same people into the parks, the downtown, public properties throughout the city. And then we get complaints there and then we dispatch crews to go out to the second location and then the third location and the fourth location. And it is the old whack-a-mole game where uh, the little uh, gopher or whatever it is keeps popping up and you hit it with a hammer and it pops up in a new slot. It is an incredibly wasteful and time-consuming process. Uh, what this kind of housing is intended to do is to give them an alternate. You can't force them to use the alternate, but I've spoken to Mr. Gill uh, and others, and if the uh, thresholds for entry are such that they can bring dog spouses that you don't have strict chemical dependence treatment, uh, you can set up housing which provides them a place to go if you clean them out of the river or you clean them out elsewhere, and you can get them introduced at, a, at an initial level to service providers and people who can potentially um, get them out of 
their, their current status. Uh, we've seen models recently publicized in the Los Angeles Times on uh, Sacramento, uh, San Diego, and Los Angeles. Sometimes these are in a kind of a tent or balloon type structure. Uh, sometimes they're in uh, portable structures. Sometimes they're in warehouses. Uh, they are high risk because you don't have the rules for entry that are pertinent to the current uh, providers. But if you want to get them uh, off the street and out of the river, and you want to stop chasing them around to four stops around town, uh, this is a means of potentially doing that uh, and at the same time uh, having uh, some level of entry into uh, services that may ultimately uh, catch up and, and assist them. Uh, so uh, an allocation to this kind of housing can have a direct result. Now the three models I just talked about filled up and never got emptied. What happens if that happens here? Well, you have 200 or 300 off the street, whatever capacity you can build, and then I guess you look at more capacity, but that's the goal. <coughs> Permanent housing or longer-term housing uh, for shelter space with uh, the public safety and vital services measure, we will have capital dollars in the early years to allocate to improvements and allocating uh, a significant amount of those capital dollars to expansion of the number of beds beyond the 40 we're each providing money for at the two facilities uh, seems to be the best way to provide a circumstance uh, where in fact they can uh, get off the streets and into services. Again, we would need this to be in partnership with other agencies for operation. Uh, and this may well be a combined revenue source with future uh, heap money or federal money or home monies from the city's budget. Uh, rapid response cleanup unit. Those of you who have been on council for a while know uh, what happened with graffiti some years back. Uh, we used to always run behind on graffiti and it, uh, it was never the source of as many complaints as the homeless issue, but it used to be three or four times what it is today. And what we did was we hired crews, we hired equipment, and we put in place a seven day a week response capability tied to the city app so that a business can go out and look at the public property behind it and it's been a mess, it's, uh, there's an abandoned encampment. Uh, they can uh, punch the city app and it's uh, geocoded and we do a direct response to the site. Or they can call in or they can email, whichever communications. But this would be an eight person unit with equipment that rolls and rolls constantly and at least reduces the time frame for the annoyance to be there and decreases the likelihood that rats or other vermin, germs, whatever will, will come in place. Now we have to, in the case of the homeless, be cognizant of laws which require notice uh, under certain circumstances and we would be sensitive to that. We would have a trained code enforcement officer functioning as the lead of the unit uh, who could make the determination in cooperation with the city attorney's office as to when the notice was done. But even if it requires notice to the citizen who's complained, at least you've responded that day and set the, the ball in motion, so to speak. Uh, it worked with graffiti. I think some of the staff concerns may be uh, that it will be so successful that we'll need to put on a second crew uh, promptly or soon after initiating this service. Um, you all know how many complaints you currently get. Um, and then finally, uh, service contracts. Uh, with uh, providers, any housing that we build, we would need service contracts uh, for operation. Uh, we also want to reach out to the service providers and say, can you help? Uh, do you have ideas that would uh, help get people off the street, help eliminate the litter problem? Uh, what uh, proposals or ideas do you have that could be given consideration and may result in addressing those two issues? I identified earlier. Uh, 
that all would follow at later dates and would again involve consultation with a variety of parties and uh, checking best practices and uh, working through issues uh, before we bring items to the City Council. So uh, with that, uh, I think, oh, I'll be frank, the millions of dollars we've invested to date, the problem has only gotten worse despite the investment. Uh, the, the many more millions of dollars that the public safety and vital services measure will bring, I think, has capability to make real and long-term impact uh, that will reduce the problem from the perspective of our citizens. But we're not, again, uh, as the mayor and I agreed earlier, uh, it isn't going away. Questions? Thank you, Mr. Tandy. Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tandy, for your presentation, and, and big thanks to the entire city uh, for their efforts in uh, addressing issues related to homelessness throughout our community. I think, uh, for me, uh, this has been the by far the number one issue uh, in Ward 2 uh, that I hear about every single day. Um, and many property owners and residents um, are obviously concerned, concerned about some of the uh, byproducts as a result of those who are uh, living uh, on the streets. Uh, my concern is much deeper though. I, I think this is a humanitarian crisis. I, I think that we as a city and partnering with the county and as a community as a whole have an obligation to address this issue. I think many of uh, the folks who are on the streets are living with mental illness and it's unacceptable that we allow that to happen and um, as a community we need to find answers. It's not just the city, it's, it's the county, it's other municipalities throughout the county, it's community groups, and we need to work together. Um, I'm excited to see some of your uh, recommendations here and strategies uh, that can bring, uh, that can help mitigate homelessness, in particular, um, the recommendation to, um, to increase the city support of the Kern County Homeless Collaborative. Uh, this is an entity that uh, receives federal dollars from the housing of, uh, of urban development uh, in the tune of five and a half million dollars annually. In, in other cities, uh, I'm aware that the continuum of care is, uh, has an applicant uh, agency that is a city or a county here. We have a nonprofit. They do an excellent job. But it's important for, I believe, for local government to be part uh, of, the, of the discussion on a regular basis and that we have a high-level staff member who is part of that governing board. And so um, I, I would really encourage uh, city staff to make that a high priority. Um, <clears throat> the, the other thing that excites me about your presentation, Mr. Tandy, is the, the idea of bridge housing. And you and I have had a conversation outside of council meeting regarding that concept. Um, the, the reality is, is there, there is an emergency situation that's happening uh, statewide, nationwide, but certainly we're feeling it locally. And we, uh, we must address that issue locally by adding more beds. And it can't be two years for us to wait for additional beds. We need to figure out ways that we can provide emergency shelter now. And so that bridge housing concept, I think, is a promising one, something that San Diego um, has um, explored and implemented and um, has seen some results. And so um, I'm encouraged also that, that city staff is looking at and exploring other alternatives, uh, best practices, if you will, uh, throughout the state and country, which I think will, will be beneficial. Um, but the other issue about bridge housing is that, um, you know, uh, flood ministries uh, will receive a grant uh, from or a contract from Behavioral Health and Recovery Services, uh, the county agency. Um, to employ, I think, somewhere around 15 uh, outreach workers. Um, and these outreach workers are making contact with homeless individuals with the idea of building a relationship and, 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 and connecting them to social services throughout the community. And it's been stated often, I hear it all the time now, that it requires 17 contacts uh, with the homeless individual before they begin uh, developing a relationship and, and, and earn enough trust so that they can, uh, or, or they, they have enough trust so that they can um, uh, trust that caseworker to, to enter services. And um, it's important for us to coordinate with uh, not only Flood but other agencies who have outreach workers. And I think it's a lot easier 
when you have a location where people are housed. If you have some, if you have a bridge, uh, you know, bridge housing, uh, if you have a location where people are, where they're sleeping every night, it's much easier to find them, and it saves a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of money than it does having people, having caseworkers trying to, uh, you know, hop around where an indivi individual may be, for example, underneath, uh, you know, r near the Garza Circle uh, one night and then maybe uh, at the Kern River uh, the, the second night, m maybe somewhere in Oildale the third night. Um, so in order to make those 17 contacts as efficiently as possible, that bridge housing model would be uh, beneficial. And then once we, then the goal is, with that emergency shelter is to get them out as soon as possible. So they're not living there for six months or a year, but they're living there no more than 90 days, getting out there so that we can open up that bed for another homeless individual. So <coughs> I, anyway, I can go on, but I appreciate the effort and it, it just, it excites me that we're moving forward and uh, thank God for Measure N so that we have the resources to do that. Thank you, and I, uh, the nice thing about some of the models for bridge housing is that it could be done in a fairly expeditious time frame. Uh, to build permanent housing is obviously going to take two to three years at an absolute minimum, more if you have to do complex uh, compilations of multiple funding sources, um, and some of these activities could be done on an emergency basis, uh, hopefully uh, in six to eight months. Vice Mayor. Thanks, Alan. I agree. Homelessness is an extremely vexing issue, not only for us, but Because for of the 32 emails I get from you every day? <laughs> <laughs> well, tomorrow might be 34. But uh, I want to talk real quick about the river cleanup. Uh, can you tell me any other stakeholders that may have a piece of, I know, I know we go in there, we take care of it, we're taking care of the waterway and stuff, but is there anybody else that has authority over that, if it's uh, the county, uh, some state agency or something. One of my concerns is with our employees going down there, having to remove this debris by hand and drag it out, and at least what I've been told, because we're not allowed to take heavy equipment down there that can you know, damage a waterway, but yet we're cleaning out tons of trash. Uh, is that true? And if it is true, is there a way we can get a waiver or something so we get some equipment down there and we don't have to put our are people in harm's way? I may uh, need to call upon someone else, but uh, I thought we did take equipment down in areas where it was accessible. There are some that aren't clearly, but. Uh, Vice Mayor Parlier, there, there is limited access to the, the Kern River uh, channel. Um, we do bring equipment down into the river itself, mostly on the levees, but as you're aware, they, the homeless tuck themselves into a lot of the shrubs and bushes within that area, so there's not a real good access from big equipment to get into without making significant destruction to the um, materials down in the channel. So yes, it does require a lot of bit, of, a lot of handwork. We are looking through Measure N to acquire smaller pieces of equipment that you can get into those areas like bobcats, smaller equipment that can go along some of these foot trails that are within the river channel that the, the homeless seem to be using, uh, and some more practical hand equipment to get down in those areas. Um, because we, we don't really, you can't really take a big uh, um, trash truck or a loader into those areas. Okay, well, whatever it takes. I just worry about our people down there. If they got to remove some of this stuff by hand that it's pretty hazardous. So, yeah, the smaller equipment sounds great. Um, Alan, we talked about this a little bit, too, regarding the, uh, the bridge program, low barrier facilities. Uh, I think it's a great program, too, uh, and I look forward to that. I think at some point, as you bring on staff with Measure End, I would love to see, you know, a point person within your office to kind of spearhead some of the stuff because I don't think it's going away tomorrow and probably will become more complicated as it goes along. And I think that we need a clearinghouse uh, with importance and gravitas uh, behind the city manager's office uh, for somebody to kind of run sheep herder on, uh, on a lot of this stuff. Understood, and uh, we will surely uh, make that arrangement. 
and we'll draw straws in the, my office staff. <laughs> I don't know whether it's short or long gets that assignment. And uh, <laughs> I have a couple other questions, but we'll follow up on those in private. So thank you so much. Councilmember Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for the presentation, and, and I do think we, we forget that we, we have been innovative and we have had a lot of success with the hiring the homeless and on our different sites and stuff, and, and that's been a great program. Um, I was just wondering, you didn't, or I didn't hear the timing when you would expect the rapid response team to maybe hit the streets. Um, Councilmember Smith, um, as a part of developing the proposed budget for Measure N, uh, we are going to have a carve out of certain early actions, excuse me, <coughs> that need to be taken. Uh, traditionally, what we would do is wait until the budget was adopted and then implement all the programs on July 1st. But in this case, uh, to buy the equipment for the rapid response team is going to take months. So we intend to bring that forward early, um, get permission to do the early acquisition list of those things which will make us functional sooner after uh, the 1st of July and be up and running. So that is uh, in preparation uh, and uh, we'll go uh, to the oversight committee for review along with uh, the other uh, budgets in regard to Measure N. Thank you. Kind of the same question on the bridge housing. What, any idea when <coughs> you might have that in place? I think the difficult part of that, because it is high risk, high liability, uh, we'll be overcoming uh, the difficulties for service providers to operate it. Uh, now the two primary ones are aware of the, the concept and have conceptually agreed, but they're going to have insurance and other issues um, which are uh, potentially difficult to overcome. Uh, we're already talking to them about that. Uh, and hopefully those kinds of obstacles can be overcome so that it can be as soon as possible. Uh, we also have to pin down the location uh, where this uh, would occur. Uh, and there aren't uh, a massive number of locations where it would be greeted uh, warmly um, by um, surrounding neighbors and citizens. Uh, and so that will require some work uh, as well, but, but the intent is to do it as quickly as possible. Thank you. Councilmember Rivera. <clears throat> thank you, uh, thank you, Mayor. I got a, um, I think a few observations or, or points I'd like to make. Um, one is, Alan, as a part of the potential contributions you listed related to the, to measure N, it, it states in here that staff is recommending that investment by the city and homelessness issue focus on two areas. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a point and then I, I kind of maybe, and I, I know this was the mayor's referral, so I'd be interested in, in learning from her, but what she'd like to do, but at least both of these items and even a conversation about a bulldozer, uh, seems to gloss over the fact that we're actually still talking about people and human beings. So this, these two issues are related to litter, debris, shopping carts, and damage and discomfort uh, to business and residents. Um, and I'm not entirely comfortable um, with those being the two areas of focus when it comes to homelessness. So I guess that's my first point. But this, the, the second point I'd like to make, because I kind of want to understand how how this council thinks this is going to work because we just got this presentation in the uh, in the context of Measure N. This is a problem that preceded Measure N. This is a problem uh, that continues now that it's passed. And Measure N and the Oversight Committee, um, I, I don't think um, is is the only place conversation should occur related to this issue. Um, and I, 
we have a pretty substantial budget outside of Measure N that um, uh, that expends resources on homelessness as well. So, I, I and I see that in the agenda it says we're staff is recommending this be received and filed. And so, I'd like to better understand how between now uh, and budget time. Um, we uh, will be able to uh, maybe get further information on on the uh, four other items you listed as um, as meriting strong consideration and how we intend to actually uh, work on those. That's something I'm I'm not in, I'm not willing to necessarily forget about or or go ahead and cross off a list for a few months. I'd rather continue that discussion now. So whether it's the rapid response uh, cleanup unit um, uh, or dedicating more city staff. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to get a better roadmap of how we intend to do that. I'm not sure I see that here. You don't. Uh, because this was, we're in about the fourth phase of going through trial runs with the various uh, departments who are primarily involved in the ballot issues prioritized by Measure N, and we probably have four more to go. Uh, so it is being developed uh, on a daily basis. I think they've gone through three conceptual lists of equipment, and we keep uh, refining the equipment list. Uh, these would all be new hires, uh, not taken from the current budget. Um, I didn't, I, I hope I uh, created an understanding that uh, we're not forgetting the soft side of services, uh, that we will enter into contracts with those who have skills in that area um, in order to assist and operate uh, the facilities, for example. Uh, but <clears throat> I point out the city's two areas of emphasis because we don't have a single social worker or psychologist or chemical dependency expert on our staff. and. Uh, we are dependent upon relations with others uh, through contracts to acquire those skills. I agree with you completely. Then, then I guess my, I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, if if there were going to be issues of focus for staff um, today and tomorrow and the next day, and even a focus for the oversight committee. Uh, then it should certainly include, and I know we've had quite a few presentations now from the Homeless Collaborative. We've gotten from them uh, a, a list um, and requests from them on what resources they need. I maintain and believe that's actually the biggest need. Um, so I just want to make sure that though we might receive and file this presentation, staff understands that there's a whole lot more we need to do um, and focus on outside of simply cleaning up litter and reducing discomfort. And I just want to make sure that the, the service contracts and how we're going to utilize the experts in the field is something uh, I would, I'd like to get more information on. Okay, it doesn't exist right now other than conceptual discussions. Okay. Talking about the theory and whether the providers were amenable to the theory, and that has been yes, but uh, um, there is a massive workload associated with the 25% expansion in the city's general fund. Uh, you, you don't, well, uh, one issue quickly, uh, just to give an example, uh, the, the historic areas where the police have their academies aren't large enough for the new size academy. So we've been looking at potential lease properties. Uh, we, we bought a property tonight we're looking at as potential training facility. I got a call from a realtor today about it. Uh, all of those involve not only the potential lease or acquisition of property, but also the retrofit of the building to make it compliant with state uh, police training standards, uh, potential extension of fiber optic cable. Uh, and that's one tiny example uh, the entire staff is consumed with this, I assure you, and we haven't and won't be uh, forgetting about it or putting it on a shelf. Uh, it's just developmental in nature now. Thank you, Mr. Tandy. Appreciate uh, your presentation. This is about people 
and this is also about quality of life. And so, Councilmember Rivera, I know Councilmember Gonzalez, you, you said the same thing about people. Yes, this is about people, and this is about quality of life, and our residents and our businesses deserve to have the quality of life that uh, they are seeking, an improved quality of life, and our homeless persons also do too. And I think together when we unite, there are many agencies that are addressing, actively addressing our homeless persons uh, to, as long as we, and I, I believe that's your intention, uh, to recognize them as people, uh, then we do what we can as a city in our area of expertise. And uh, I think that's what you are proposing. So just to address some of the areas that you spoke about, uh, you were saying, uh, talking about funding, and yes, that funding does enable us to move ahead. Tomorrow I will be on a conference call with the big city mayors, and I know that that is a priority of ours to continue to seek funding and to actively advocate for that, uh, especially in Sacramento. So that will be ongoing. Uh, thank you for getting out the word about volunteers for the point in time count. And I think we have about 500 volunteers uh, due to massive efforts in our community versus 200 last year. So we are expecting that the number will go out up. That does not mean that the collaborative has done a bad job, but we need to get an accurate count. But thank you to everybody who is um, going to be out there at 4 a.m. and who already is preparing the way. I see some of our uh, homeless collaborative members here, so thank you very much for being here. Mr. Tandy, the areas that you address, those four areas, are indeed gaps. And I am glad that we are looking at those. Certainly the triage, uh, we have talked about that. That has been a gap, the, the low barrier. We hear about people with pets who just will not go to the homeless center or to the mission in spite of the good work that they're doing. So that certainly is a gap. It's very complicated. Many of us attended League of California Cities. We've heard presentations from other communities about what they're doing, and it's complex, but I'm glad that we are looking at that area, so thank you. Permanent housing, long-term shelter space, indeed, that is the ultimate goal, to have permanent housing. It uh, has to be coupled with supportive services, as I know you recognize, and that's where our partners come in, and so that is the federal model to have permanent supportive housing. We're short on that in our community, but I'm glad we're addressing that. Um, with a rapid response, certainly uh, you hear from me and uh, my colleagues on a regular basis, and we do need to be able to respond more rapidly. So I am uh, encouraged that we are looking at technology, which can help us greatly now in that area, and then partnering with our service providers to make sure that uh, we are communicating on a regular basis. Uh, I am uh, encouraged that we are doing that. Uh, none of this we know happens overnight. It's a long journey, and I think uh, we are all committing to that long journey together. And when we do that uh, as a city and with all of our community partners, I know that there are people who are willing to come alongside uh, with the low barrier housing or the triage. The faith community has reached out to me saying if there were a central place, we would send people out there to help and support what we're doing. Uh, doctors have reached out saying we will provide transportation. So there are many in our community in the business community who are willing to be a part of the solution. And I know as we continue to work together, um, I would encourage us, as Councilmember Rivera said, to, um, to have regular updates. So I know that there is so much, it's complex in, in what you've already uh, stated, but if you can provide us with regular updates as to where we are in the process and uh, whatever it is that we can do uh, to assist in the process. I am certainly willing to do whatever I can to be helpful in the process, and I imagine my colleagues would uh, also do that. But thank you very much for this update, and uh, thank you to our community also for engaging. Thank you. Anything else, colleagues? I need a motion. Yeah, one more thing, uh, Alan, real quick. So I'd like to go out on the uh, the night of the pick count as uh, an observer. I don't know if you can help facilitate. Oh, you should it. be a worker. <laughs> well, I think I mi might have missed the time frame as mm -hmm. far as going through the class. But if that's still open, I'm willing to do that too. Uh, but if not, uh, I'd like to go out and observe and see what's going on also. 
I could help us okay. with that. Jessica Jansen's in the audience. You might be able to connect with her after <laughs> that, and she'll uh, let you know how that works. But uh, you might have to go through that two-hour training on uh, your own and have private lessons. Look, look forward to it. Motion to receive a file. You have a motion. Please cast your votes. Motion is approved. Thank you. Next item, please. Council and Mayor statements. Colleagues, I don't see any requests to speak. <laughs> Vice Mayor, once you find that button. Okay, Vice Mayor, and then we'll have Councilmember Smith. Sorry. You want to go first, Bob? Either one, either way. Okay. So in light of uh, Councilmember Freeman's statements last council meeting and Willie's statements tonight, uh, I think it would help us all on the city council if we had some sort of a workshop to talk about some goals. Uh, so I'd like to have staff set that up, maybe a half day workshop uh, at the end of this month and we can discuss goals, uh, maybe some budgetary items too, uh, outside of N. I know we have a big budget uh, besides the uh, the 50 million. Um, also, if city staff could update the city council committee website, um, not website, but the city council site regards to committees and also the, um, the specific one where it talks about council members on their bios too. It has some stuff on committees and that needs to be updated also. And an update on the recycle center inspections that code enforcement was going to do, and I'm just curious on what the results were on that. Thank you. Council Member Smith. Thank you, Mayor. I just uh, wanted to comment that, you know, working through these issues with Measure N is a great problem to have and, and appreciate staff, and I know it's a lot of work, but uh, it really uh, is going to be a positive and is a positive for the community in the long run. Thank you. Councilmember Sullivan. Oh, thank you. And yes, Bob, uh, good point. It's what a, what a burden trying to figure out where to spend this money. But believe me, it will be, it's needed. A lot of hard work went into um, informing the public. And so we're very, very thankful that, it, that the community did respond and, and uh, uh, gift us with, with their part of the solution. Um, I did want to mention yesterday, um, <clears throat> two days ago, Martin Luther King breakfast. Appreciated uh, sitting at the mayor's table. Uh, but the, the, the community center at Mar Martin Luther King Park um, was just, like, once again, it was just filled. And uh, I, I really had such a strong feeling that I I could just imagine, I mean, I, mean I, I can remember back in 1955 when they first started talking about the, the, the peaceful, um, the, the, it's the, this peaceful protest. We'd never heard of such a thing, peaceful protest. Protests had always been fighting and sticks and hitting each other and, uh, you know, just a lot of anger. So. But to see that group, just the beautiful spirit that is always there, um, I, I just knew that Martin Luther King would know that his efforts had not been in vain and that he would be very, very pleased. And uh, the community leaders that work hard to put that on every year, it's, it's something that I personally, and I know that the ones that go every year really look forward to, to how how nice it always is, and, and uh, Wesley Crawford was, uh, was the chairman this year. He did a great job. You know, it, I, we've all known him for years. He's come a long way. He's just a wonderful public servant now and working in, in uh, his part of Bakersfield. So it, once again, it was just a treat to be there, and, and uh, um, you know, so we're on our way you know, as far as race relations are concerned, and, and now we're, uh, we're working hard to uh, combat the homeless issue that we have. So anyway, 
feel very good about the direction of our city and of course the beginning of this new year so I, I know it's going to be a good year for our city. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, thank you all for being here. I see a young man from Bakersfield College and Professor Holmes' class. You endured when everybody else left. So uh, come up here, and I'll write you a note if you need that. Uh, Boy Scouts, thank you again so much for being here. And it looks like we have some other young people. Are you with a group? What is your group? We're with the Light of the World Church. Oh, yes. Okay, that's right. Thank you all very much for being here. And uh, Thanks all, and good night, and we will adjourn this meeting at 7-11.